Jesus, we acknowledge that we are in the presence of the Holy God, the Creator of the universe. That we are in the presence of the One who holds all things together. And without you, nothing would exist. That we are in the presence of the One who created us gave us life. And the one who keeps that life. And we're here today to worship humbly before you. To praise you for all your goodness and loving kindness. To testify of your great mercies and to allow the Holy Spirit to take the Word of God and work it into our hearts that we might be conformed to your image. That's what we're here today for, Father. So we give ourselves to your Spirit, we give ourselves to your Word, we give ourselves to you to have your way with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome this morning. I want to give a special welcome to our visitors today. They were here with Jane, visiting with Jane. I'm glad to have you. Uh, you know, a couple of days ago was the first day of summer. And it sure feels like it. <laughs> but let's go to the Lord's Prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day that you have given us. We thank you that we have the opportunity to be united together to worship and praise you. Lord, we just ask you to open the eyes to our hearts. Lord, Lord clear our minds from all worldly things. Help us to focus and to meditate on your word and to sing joyful noises to you. And Lord, we just pray that you would be with Brother Hugh as he brings your word, hiding behind the cross. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother, I thought you were going to be studying this morning. No. Okay. Well, I heard you did it while I was out. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to begin today by singing Because He Lives. 
hymn number 407. And it is because he lives that we have our being. So if you stand with me, is it going on and on? Yeah. It's because he lives that we have our being and that we're here today. So if you stand with me, we'll stand together. In number four, I'm sitting. I thank you.
but them not having to deal with my sin nature anymore. Life is one thing. It's hard. It's rough. But my sin nature is something terrible and it never leaves me alone. And then one day, the presence of that nature won't be here anymore. Amen? Amen. What a glorious day that is. God is so good, He not only saves us, He sanctifies us, He brings us to the point of stepping across into heaven and living with Him eternity. Eternally, I'm sorry. <clears throat> That's the hope of every born-again believer is the Holy Spirit that dwells us. That's what we rise and we look for, and that's because of all that we can face whatever the day brings. Not only can we face it, but we can be overcomers in it. Amen. We can live in victory. Do I need to say that again? Amen. We can live in victory today. We don't have to live in defeat. We don't have to live in depression. We don't have to live in despondency. We don't have to live in rejection. We have the hope of Almighty God in dwellness and we can live in victory. Amen. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what you're facing tomorrow or the next day. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you have His Spirit in dwelling, you listen to me. The Bible tells us that there is victory for us. And we overcome the world by His blood and the word of our testimony. Amen? Amen? So it's time to testify. It's time for the word of your testimony to be spoken. So anybody would like to testify, I want to encourage you. Man, it'd be great if everybody came and everybody was just chomping at the bit to say something about Jesus. Amen? I know all of you have something. Kenneth Carroll has something. I'm making him write it down. Because <laughs> he needs to get it out, right? If he doesn't, his heart will burst. And we don't want that to happen, do we, Louise? No, I can't do nothing about that. Amen. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going we're gonna to move on. We're going to sing 424, Heavenly Sunshine. 424, Heavenly Sunshine. <laughs>
Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we thank you for the special time of this service that we can worship you by giving back to you. Lord, we just thank you so much for all that you have done for us. And Lord, we just pray that this offering will be used to spread your love, grace, and mercy yes. in this neighborhood and all throughout the world. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Yes, sir. A screw. Okay, are we on? Okay, I'll try it. Genesis chapter 15. While you're looking there, I mean, it's Wi-Fi is great, technology great, but you can't beat a cable. <laughs> Some things were built to last. <laughs> Genesis chapter 15. Now, I usually ask y'all to stand for in reverence to the reading of God's Word. If you feel like standing, you can go ahead. If you don't, don't worry about it because it's a long passage I'm going to read. Okay? So if you feel like you just need to sit, Sit, and that I, the Lord knows that you stand in your heart. Okay? That's what the Lord looks at. Genesis chapter 15, verse 7. I will preface the reading of this with God has already promised Abraham a son, a nation, and a land. That's His promise. He has promised the Messiah to Abraham. So we go from that promise and here in chapter 15 it says in verse 7, And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, and a ram three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought them all these and cut them in half and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham, and behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offerings will be your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be their servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment upon the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. 
On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Heavenly Father, as we look into your word today, may we realize the covenant that you have made with us. May we realize the covenant that we have made with each other as the body of Christ. And Father, may we fulfill that in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. The word covenant refers to a formal arrangement between two or more parties. It is an agreement by lease, deed, or legal contract. It is an agreement between two parties. Now, in this covenant God made with Abraham, Abraham was asleep. That just goes to show you God works on you while you're asleep. We think we go to sleep sometimes and we just are resting, but God's at work. But Abraham's asleep and God, this, this was the way that two men would perform a covenant, an agreement with each other that would be legally binding in the sight of everybody around. But God was the one who went through the midst of the offering. He was the fire pot. He was the flaming torch that passed through. Abraham was asleep. So what God was saying to Abraham is, is I'm going to make a covenant with you, but I'm taking care of both sides of the covenant. Abraham, you don't, you know, you, you're just involved in it, but I am, I am going to fulfill the legal obligations of both sides of the covenant, mine and yours. And cutting through a lot of stuff, that's what God did on the cross with Jesus. He made a covenant with us, and we're going to see that. And he fulfilled his part and our part too. Because he knows we're just dust and there's no way we can fulfill our part. But we have here a picture of what a covenant is and I wanted to paint that picture in your mind and for you to see that yes, Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins and it is a free gift from God and we love him for that, but it's also a covenant that He made with us. A binding legal agreement that God has made with those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This covenant that, that God has made is a covenant of blood. Luke 22, 20 says, And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant of my blood. This is when Jesus was at the, at the Passover meal with his disciples and he was they were participating in the meal and it came time for that cup to be passed and drunk and Jesus says this is the new covenant. The new covenant, the new legal binding agreement between me and you and it's my blood. What does scripture say without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. Unless blood, pure blood, sacrificial blood is poured out, there is no forgiveness, there is no taking away of sins. You see, we're not only, if we believe in Jesus, this covenant He's made with it, it it's just not forgiving us, it takes them away. They were placed on Jesus at the cross. He became our sin. So when God looks at a believer in Jesus Christ, He doesn't see their sin. He doesn't see their past. He sees the blood of the covenant. This covenant is a covenant of life. 2 Corinthians 3, 5-6. through 6. Now I know I'm going through the different verses, but you take your bulletin and you write them down. You go back and read them yourself. That's why that space is there in the bulletin. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5-6. and 6. It says, not that we have sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So this covenant that God has made between man and himself is a covenant of life. 
You see, the law condemns. It points out our sin. It points out our disbelief. It points out it's good because it needs to be pointed out to us, right? Amen. That's one of the problems with our society today is we've removed God from, from our society. It's not like it was when we were children and the Bible and God was more prominent. And our children and grandchildren... They have a sense that something isn't right, but they don't know what it is. They don't know, thus saith the Lord. But when you read Scripture, you read, thus saith the Lord, and it is death to us because it condemns us. That's why some people don't like to read their Bibles. They see a holy God and a sinful man. And who wants their faults pointed out to them? But we have to. But the Spirit gives life. It is the Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. It's part of the covenant that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, He sends His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to indwell us. We were talking about Scripture a while ago. I liked Francis' testimony. It wasn't any better than anybody else's, but I liked it because it's so true. I hear people all the time say, well, I just can't understand the Bible, so I don't read it. Or I can't understand Hebrew, so I read Psalms over and over and over again. You're going to get a distorted view of God. <coughs> but if the Holy Spirit is indwelling us, and we're reading Scripture, one of His jobs, one of His duties, one of the work that He comes to sanctify us is to teach us all things and bring to remembrance what Jesus said and did. So he's our teacher. Now we have Sunday school where I teach and Miss Marcia teaches and all, but you know what? If we're teaching the truth of the Word of God and the Spirit, power of the Spirit, we're not getting it from anybody but the Holy Spirit because he's the one that instructs us. And you, I tell people all the time, they'll call and they'll say, well, you need to have this person come and you need to have this and you need to have that. Do we have itching ears that we have to run around and hunt for people to teach us? I tell them, I have the same Holy Spirit and the same Bible that they have. If I just read and get on my knees, God will tell me what to do and what to say. And if you're a brother and sister in Christ, you have the same Holy Spirit I do and the same Bible I do. And if you would just take the time, it may be early in the morning, it may be late at night, it may be in the dark of night when nothing else is going on. But if you'll take your Bible and you'll read it and you'll pray, the Holy Spirit that indwells each believer will teach. That's what He's supposed to do. We just don't do it, do we? I didn't for a long time until God convicted me and embarrassed me in front of a bunch of children. You want to be humble, you let God embarrass you in front of, in front of a bunch of children. But He wants to teach us. So it's a covenant of life. But it's also a covenant for eternity in Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 13 through 15. It says, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? have our minds and our conscience purified. Therefore, He is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. It's a new covenant. It's an eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. We talk about living with Jesus for eternity. We talk about 
living in heaven with Him. We talk about He's preparing a place for us. All this is true. But it's only by the blood of Jesus Christ in the new covenant that we can hold on to that promise. Because without that covenant, without that blood, there is no eternal hope for us. We do all this in vain. Years ago, I won't name the publisher, but there was a Bible publisher in the United States that was, they tried twice to remove blood from the Bible. It's not good. Kids shouldn't read about blood, the spilling of blood, the killing of animals. I, you know, this, this isn't good. We need to take it out of the Bible. That was here in America. That wasn't in some communist country. Praise the Lord. Some godly people on the boards put it down. Because you take the blood out, you take the new covenant out, you take salvation out, you take all of that crumbles if we remove the blood of the covenant. That's why when we have our Lord's Supper, we drink the juice, the, the cup that reminds us of the blood we're remembering the covenant that God has made with us. Now, this is the covenant Jesus made with us. That if we would believe in Him and His shed blood, He's the Christ, the Son of the living God who gave Himself as a sacrifice for my sin and your sin. Not just to forgive it, but to take it away from us. To remove it from our lives. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've accepted Him as your Savior, your old nature may still be there and it is there, but it has no power over you anymore. You can overcome it. And some of you sitting here today have overcome it in a great way, in a visible way, in a miraculous way. And some of us have overcome it quietly. But we're overcomers. We're not subject to it. None of this stuff about, well, the devil made me do it. No. No. Well, I just can't help myself. I'm wired that way. No. You see, under the new covenant, under the blood, you've been rewired. Amen? Amen. I mean, that ought to be shouting joy that, that I'm rewired. I'm not the same anymore. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, neither are you. People who put their faith in Jesus Christ and they accept Him as their Savior and they enter into this new covenant God has made, the covenant of blood, are bound together by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Now we've kind of lost that thought. And I want to interject it again. You see, we talk a lot about the church the church is just the, the assembly of the saved. The word church, ecclesia, just means the assembly. So if we say the phrase, I'm going to church, we're going to the assembly. But you see, according to Scripture, we are the church. And we meet and we assemble together. We assemble for different things. We assemble this morning for Bible study. We're assembled now for worship. We're going to assemble this afternoon to talk about the ministries of the church. We're going to assemble for prayer meeting to this afternoon. We're going to assemble for a fellowship time this afternoon. We're an assembling people. We find joy in being together. I've shared this illustration with you before in that there's no greater joy I have in this world than to get off work and go home and be with Hope and Abigail. And I long for Ethan to come to his senses and move back home. <laughs> he probably watched this. I find joy being with those who are closest. And I hope you find joy being with those who are closest to you, whoever they may be. 
but as brothers and sisters in Christ, as members of the body of Christ, the household of God, we ought to find joy in being together. Do we? Where's Sam? How many are here today, Sam? I saw you count. Oh, he can't remember. So many here, he can't remember. He has to pull out his nose. 39. There are 39 people here today. If there, if all of us are believers, there's 39 brothers and sisters here today. Amen? Amen. And we have joy in the Lord to be in together. Amen? Amen? There ought to be 39 people here at the church conference this afternoon. <laughs> Amen. To have joy together. There ought to be 39 people here at prayer meeting tonight having joy together. Going, Francis. <laughs> we ought to have 39 people here tonight for the fellowship, having joy together. Amen. I mean, Sunday go down till after seven. I mean, eight o'clock. We are the body of Christ, and we're known according to Scripture by our love for one another. Our joy in the Lord and one another and desire to be. See, we've lost that. We just come to church and we go home and if we don't feel like it or it's not on our calendar. Oh, it wasn't on our, our refrigerator. We have everything we do on our refrigerator. It's not on our refrigerator, so we didn't, we didn't know we were supposed to do it. Oh, I didn't read the bulletin this week, so I forgot. You see what I'm trying to say? We shouldn't have to depend on those things. There ought to be this churning desire within us to be together. Because we get encouraged. We get uplifted. We get admonished. We get pushed. We push each other along the path of Christ's likeness. But if we're just coming to church to have a meeting, to go home and all, none of that happens. We've lost it, brothers and sisters. And we need to get it back. But we have a church covenant now used to. I'm going to look because I don't think it's here. In every good Southern Baptist church, the church covenant, no, nope, we're not a good Southern Baptist church. I'm sorry to tell you all that. But in every good Southern Baptist church, the church covenant was pasted in the hymnal. I remember reading it as a teenager when I became a Christian. Nobody told me about it. I just saw it and read it. But we have a church covenant. And you say, well, I joined this church and I didn't hear anything about it. Well, you're fixing here and I apologize you didn't hear about it before. But I want to look at the first paragraph. I started to make copies so y'all can read it together. Maybe I'll put it in the bulletin next week so you can read this thing. It's in our Constitution and Bylaws. This is an, a, an agreement that the members of this church make together. Listen to the first paragraph. Having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do most solemnly and joyfully enter in covenant with one another as one body in Christ. That's the beginning of our agreement together. You see, we talk about joining the church. Maybe we need to change the wording of it. Because when we get saved, we've joined the church. Amen? Amen? We've been put in the body of Christ. Amen? But there are local individual meetings and assemblies and we are, we are, we are, are, are uh... oh man, I'm too old for this. We are aligning ourselves with a certain assembly to worship and serve together. I mean, hey, you drive down the street, there's plenty of churches to go to. 
But as we seek God and as we pray and we seek Him and say, God, what do you want us to do? Where do you want us to be? He leads us to certain places. And our visitors here today are seeking God about what to do with their lives. And the answer they get from me is, I'll pray for you that God puts you where He wants you so you can do what He wants you to do. Because it may not be here. Let's just face the fact. If they're seeking God, He may send them to Brazil. Amen? We don't know. They need Domino's pizzas in Brazil, don't they, John? But I want us to look at this church covenant. We have aligned ourselves here together. God has brought us together for this day, this time, to serve Him together. The first part of it is that we have to be saved. Anybody can come worship with us, but we can only allow saved people to enter into this covenant. Because only saved people are in the body of Christ. Right? Not turning people away, not, not meaning any offense. But let's face it, that's what the body of Christ did. Is it, they used to say it was the, it was the uh, how did it go? The body of baptized believers. Is that how it went, Marcia? They used to put it that way. But the body of Christ is a group of saved people aligning themselves together. It says, having been led, we are led, as we believe by the Spirit of God. It is God who saves us. He made the covenant of blood. He did both. He did everything necessary. All we had to do was say, okay. To receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. So the firstborn of this covenant together that we made is have to be a believer in Jesus Christ. You have to have come to the point of repenting of your sins and the desiring to give your life to Jesus and then align yourself with us. And then it says, and on the profession of our faith, it has to be professing faith. I know in church history there was this the time where you had secret Christians who were hiding out from persecution and you had other Christians who were dying daily for Christ and there was a big argument within the church well these secret Christians who are hiding out they don't want to be persecuted they're not really Christians. Don't we have the same argument today? Well they're afraid to talk about Jesus. I don't see Sam singing. He never cracks a hymn. Crack, cracks a hymn. No. He must not really be saved, Ken. We need to take him off the deacon board. Because if he was saved, he's going to praise the Lord to the. He's going to rip these tiles off the ceiling praising the Lord, right? Chairman Deacon says that's it, Sam. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? We can't be judgmental, but we have to be professing. We have to be willing to stand up and give a testimony. We have to be willing to say, I believe in Jesus. How many of y'all remember Columbine? You know what I'm talking about? Are you willing to stand up when somebody points a gun at you and says, I believe in Jesus? knowing that you're going to get popped off. Some of those teenagers. 